Hello, Vianne here. How are you guys doing? I wonder, do we remember some of the conversations that we were having before COVID? And how much of our conversations are different now? Uh, the topic of mental health is still very much a part of what we talked about before and what we are talking about now. You see, before COVID, there was even this momentum around mental health. We were talking about it more. And right here in Edmonton, we actually hosted the HOPE Conference on the Bell Let's Talk Day. We're talking about it more. And today, I just thought it was really um, important to just come back to that. And I actually wanted to share with you one of the messages from my dear friend uh, and mentor, uh, Bob Jones, as he talks about faith and mental health and how we can bridge that gap to make a difference now and moving forward during and after this COVID season. Thank you, Vian. Ken Chan was a quiet man. At least that's how his wife and all the people who knew him described him. And that's how I would have described him. I knew him for just over two decades. He was ex-military, a quarter century of honorable service as a medic for the Canadian Armed Forces. His friends called him Charlie, Charlie Chan. He uh, always had a big smile and a great sense of humor. Uh, he was a real Canadian hero. Uh, he was generous and compassionate. Uh, he freely gave his time, uh, his money, uh, his skills and his passion to other people and to animals. He was a humanitarian. You see, Ken always put other people first. Uh, he was the kind of guy that gave the help and never asked for help. And he always put people ahead of his own suffering. I always think that Ken tried to help other people as a way to cope with his own suffering. He was quiet, silent, and secretive about his pain until the first week of December, 2019. Ken was 62 years old when he took a taxi to the Alberta legislative grounds. The gun that he carried was as well hidden as the pain that was in his life. He wanted to make a statement to legislators and he had timed the end of his life to the gathering of the house. And if you look in the Hansard records, you see that at 322 on December 2nd, the Legislative Assembly of Alberta was suddenly dismissed. There was cause for concern. A shot had been fired. But the only person that day at risk was Ken Chan. Somebody else who may have been far less caring and compassionate may have hurt other people to make a statement, but not Ken. The only person who got hurt that day was Ken. And he hurt himself to end his hurting. You see, Ken was one of my congregants. He was a part, along with his wife, Judy, of a sacred trust that I'd been given. And Ken died on my watch. I don't think Ken wanted to die. He wanted to live. He just didn't know how he could keep living and carry the pain that he'd carried for decades. He'd run out of ways. And days later, I sat at his wife's kitchen table and we planned Ken's memorial service. A kitchen table like many I've sat at with too many grieving parents and spouses and siblings. And on the day when hundreds of people who were mourning Ken's death gathered together, I shared a message, and I'm going to share a little bit about that as we close our Let's Talk Hope Day together. For those of you who know me, and some of you have gotten to know me a little bit, and there's a lot of friends in the room, you know that I'm just like Ken. Uh, I, I'm a quiet guy. Uh, I, I really prefer listening to talking. Uh, you might not believe that because anybody who knows me knows that uh, core to what I do for the last 40 years has been public speaking. Um, and what I've discovered is this. When I have something to say, I won't stay quiet. My cousin Sharon doesn't have a voice anymore. Uh, she married her childhood sweetheart. And it wasn't very long after they were married that her husband left her. He said that he, he just couldn't cope with her moods. And so we all knew how devastated Sharon was. We knew that she was hurting and she put on a brave face, but we had no idea. And our family was gutted when Sharon ended her own life. They found her in her bedroom on the bed that she had shared with her husband. We had no understanding of what she was going through. We had no sense of how deep her agony was. 
And so I devoted my life to speaking up for Sharon, to speaking up for her memory and to become an advocate to reduce the stigma around mental illness and to try to raise awareness for hope. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm not quiet. That's one of the reasons I got involved with the John Cameron Changing Lives Foundation. And for the last 11 years, we've helped to raise money and we've raised three quarters of a million dollars for local mental health initiatives through the Singing Christmas Tree. Maybe you've been there or through Crescendo, which we do at, at Winspear. And I know there's people in this room that were inspired at Crescendo and came to this event thinking that you could experience some of the same things. And I know there are people like Ken who actually shared his story on the platform at the Winspear of what occurred in his life when his wife lost her life as well. And... Coming alongside uh, people like that, um, it's absolutely incredible and strong. And, and you, people need support. And right now, I need support. I need a friend. So I'm going to I ask Lori Patrick if she would come and, and help me at this time. Uh, I've known Lori for about 30 years. Her and her husband are involved in the Edmonton area. And so I asked Lori if she would come and help me. And I made sure that she is uh, physically sound and uh, really strong. You're strong, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, Lori, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is um, just take like three steps back. Excellent. Then put your right arm. Actually, you're going to turn and face everybody so they can see you. Put your right arm straight in front of you. Hold it out straight. And then what I'd like you to do is put your fingers around the handle on this glass, okay? Okay. And, and how are you doing with that? Really good. Really okay. Good. So... All right, thank you. So Lori and her husband and my wife Jocelyn and I have been involved in very much the same kind of uh, activities. Um, her, Lori and her husband are pastors and, and I've been a pastor. Uh, and Jocelyn and I have tried in all of our churches to create a safe place for those who are facing mental illness. And see, I'm not sure about you, but churches and places of faith can be the least safe place for people facing mental illness. I understand that. And it's not because people in there are not well-intentioned. They are. They're just not well-informed. Right? And so people do what they know. And so when you're in a place of faith or sacredness, you, you do what you know and what helped you. So the idea of prayer or faith or even reading sacred texts, that's what you offer to people because it helped you. But I'll tell you what, you can't tell a person with depression, just pray it away. You, you can't tell somebody who's bipolar, just faith it away. You, you, you can't tell someone who is BPD, read your Bible or the Quran. And if it doesn't work for you, read more of it, because that'll help you, because it helped me. And, and very often we end up giving pat answers to complex problems. And we don't mean to do that, but that's just who we are, right? And so sometimes people take an either or approach and, and they're very firm about that. And, and I think we need to take an approach that uses the word and. So it's prayer and medication. It's faith and counseling. It's empathy and vulnerability and psychiatry. They all work together. And what I've discovered in the course of my life that mental illness or depression or phobias or anxiety are no respecters of persons. They don't discriminate based on age or sex or socioeconomic status or ethnicity or even religion. I wish you could meet a young lady named Sam. In fact, you know, kind of meeting Kaylee today, you met Sam. How you doing over here, Laura? You doing okay? Okay, okay. Good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if, you if you've met Kaylee, you kind of met Sam. If you've heard Blake's story, you kind of know Sam's story. See, Sam was in grade three when she was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And because anxiety and depression are invisible, people tend to treat, and they did this with Sam, the way they, they treat other people. Um, they say, just snap out of it. That's what they told Sam. Snap out of it. Just, just think positive. You can do better than this. You're better than being anxious or depressed. And I love Sam's answer. She's a high school student. And she says, you know what? When I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression and people told me to snap out of it, I'd said to them, if I could have snapped out of it, I would have snapped out of it before you told me to snap out of it. Right? You just can't do that. You can't do that. Cancer has no stigma to it. It doesn't. And uh, cancer is met with sympathy and empathy, but mental illness has a stigma to it. We've heard about that today. We hear it over and over again. Oh, Lord, how you doing? <laughs> All right, just hang in there a bit. Long. Oh, you got your other hand out there now. Oh, see, so okay. Mm, well, no, uh, <laughs> but just don't spill it. Okay, just don't spill it. You know, I, I'm not sure how we got to the place in our society when if you feel ill, you have to hide in shame. 
If you feel mentally ill, you have to hide in shame. You see, when you talk about someone with cancer and they say, I've got cancer, what, what, what do people do? They, they describe them as a person, well, you must be brave. You're so courageous. You're determined. But you know when they describe somebody who has a mental illness, phobia or anxiety, then they're described as weak um, or, or maybe even unmotivated, right? So how do we, we get there with those descriptions? Uh, but we are there. We got there. And the way that people get treated differently is what this meeting is all about today. The ability to raise awareness, uh, to reduce stigma, the ability to create a conversation, the, the ability to come alongside and to be able to help out other people, the ability to reduce that stigma. Um, you see, uh, my wife Jocelyn was diagnosed with depression. And she was also diagnosed with cancer. So she knows the two. Um, Jocelyn should really be up here speaking. She's over here at our book table. Uh, she is the, uh, yeah, she's the spunky, funky one of our relationship. Uh, Joss, I'm the quiet guy. She's the talker. Jocelyn has lots of words. And, uh, and those words are always good. So if you haven't met her and you've been over to get one of our books, please see her before you leave today uh, and, and be able to get connected to her. But this is really her story, and she let me tell it. You see, when she was diagnosed with cancer, people, they cried. There were tears, there were hugs, there were prayers. Let me pray for you, Jocelyn. And, and as Sally King said, there were casseroles, lots of casseroles. The, the more dire your diagnosis, the, the more casseroles you get. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, when people are diagnosed with a mental illness, what they're met with, silence and suspicion and blame and way too often shame. Why is it that way? Why is it doesn't have to stay that way, Right. We're the ones that can change that. We're the ones that can make a difference. You know, tonight over at Rogers, there's going to be the Battle of Alberta, right? Calgary and, and uh, Edmonton, they're going to be playing. I'll tell you what, the Battle of Alberta is right here, right now, in this place, with these pays. And it's with people like Lori. So it's getting a bit heavy, eh, Lori? Would you like to let me take that glass of water? Okay, before I do that, okay. When you first picked it up, it wasn't too heavy, was it? Like, you could manage it. Is your back starting to feel sore? It's not so much my back. It would be like, right. Perhaps I'm not holding it right. Oh, no, you're holding it right. Yeah. You know, if you hold that for a minute, you can do it, right? If you begin to hold it for three, like Lori has been, it starts to hurt, not just in the arm, but eventually to your back, right? Think about if you hold it for a whole hour. You're not, your arm goes numb and your fingers cleave to the cup. Many of you in this room and so many people in Edmonton have been holding their cup for too long. You see, the weight doesn't change, but the longer you hold it, the heavier it gets. And some people have been holding what they're facing and how, oh, thank you, Lori. Give Lori a good hand. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Some people have been holding their weight way, way too long. And today is the opportunity for somebody to come alongside you and take the weight from you. That's what Jocelyn and I have done. That's why we wrote a book. Uh, we spent our own money to publish a book. And, and uh, we wrote it about stories. I love telling stories. And the book is about 11 women and their 11 stories. That's why we called our book, You're Going to Be Okay. You see, those words are words that are real and solid. They're filled with hope. And, and, and what they say is the idea that no matter what you're going through, however intense it is, that you're going to get through this. That no matter how deep the mess is, with God's help, you can get through this. That it's important not to panic. It's important not to act foolish or be naive. But it's also important not to despair. And for your own circumstances and whatever you may be facing in life, the idea of having five words today. What if you came here today only for five words? What if those five words were for you? I'm going to be okay personally, to embrace them. You've come to a place where you've heard, don't isolate. Uh, find your village. Grow a village. Uh, don't go silent. Don't be like Ken, holding it to himself, not asking for help, but only willing to give help. You see, words have power. And we created Rev Words, Jocelyn and I, because they do have power. Words can shame you or words can free you. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. The truth is, you're going to be okay. The truth is, hope is real. The truth is that tomorrow will be better 
for you as you follow through on that. The truth is that you've come to a place where you've chosen to join the hope movement just by being here today. And you can take one more step in that. On the card that's on the table, there's an email address that we'd love you to email so that this conversation doesn't get quieter after the 29th. It actually gets louder because more and more people are about spreading hope. More and more people are about spreading help. And that's what the hope movement's all about. And if you take that card, take that email, send it from your phone or your computer, uh, you'll be involved in a conversation that will be ongoing and will continue to raise hope to reduce stigma and create awareness and bring help to people, not only in this room, but people who need to hear that. Thank you for joining me today. And I just want to encourage you all to not carry what you're carrying alone and to look for ways that we can all support each other during and after this COVID season. Thank you for watching. Take care of yourself and each other.